Hi, I'm Daniel Wordsworth. For more than 30 years, I've experienced war zones, natural disasters, refugee camps, and sprawling slums. Now I'm going to show you a better and more optimistic world. This podcast is Finding Good. How are you, Daniel? Hi, Fitz. I'm good. Good. Thank you. Excellent. How are you doing? Super. Thank you very much for listening to Finding Good. Please, if you could uh, go and rate the podcast, in whether it's Apple or Spotify, it just, it just helps us get discovered a little bit more. And that it's great to see more and more people enjoying the episodes each week. I wanted to talk about something today that you, you touched on briefly in the first season mm-hmm. uh, and we haven't really mentioned since, but it's China. Right. And when I think of the places you've been, it's always the, the South Americas or, you know, Central Africa, America right. or Africa. Mm-hmm. But you spent some time in China, right? Yeah. No, I lived there for two years. Right. What were you doing in China? The time that I lived there, I was trying to learn about a thing called social entrepreneurship. Okay. You're going to have to explain that. To <laughs> me. You're going to have to explain that to me. So this happened around about the mid-2000s. There was a rise in a movement that was around this idea of social entrepreneurship. Now, what that did is it it sort of made a distinction. It tried to blend two things. So you had the nonprofit world, mm-hmm. the charities that go and work in Asia and Latin America and Africa trying to do good, and their work is based on donations and maybe some grants. And then on the other side, you have you know the, the governments or the business community that are doing their thing. So the idea was, could you blend business? with nonprofits. So in other words, could you create a business that's not just there to create shareholder value, but actually to do social good? Right. You know, a social entrepreneurship or a social business can work, you know, one of two ways, really. So one way is that it does normal stuff. And so it might be selling you just normal water or it might be it actually I know somebody that ran um pubs and they okay. called it a social business. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, in the US she had three or four pubs, but what she did is she of the of the profit that she made, she would give 10 or 20% of that to help causes around the world. Okay. So it's like a normal business, but it uses its profits in a different way. Right. Another type of social business is one where the business itself produces goods that are themselves impactful for society or useful. So I suppose you could look at micro power systems that work around the world yes. where you go to a village and you have micro power systems where the community has to buy the micro power system, but it's producing electricity which produces social change in the community. So this is this idea of social entrepreneurship. The advantage of it is it allows you to access capital markets, it allows you to have profit, it allows you to innovate in ways that you can't as a nonprofit. But it's giving back to the world. But it's giving back to the and world. So what, hang on, so what were you doing in the social entrepreneur space? Well, were I, you a social entrepreneur? Uh, well, I've started two social businesses, so I suppose you could call me that. I'm not a very good one. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't be doing this now. <laughs> yeah, I still I, I still prefer the nonprofit way, and that's because I, I want to help uh, empower everyday people to do good in the world. That's what I really like to do. That's what I think of as my calling. Yes. But in the mid 2000s, this was like a, a thing that was emerging. Like how could we use entrepreneurship to do good? Hmm. And I thought this was like a new thing that was coming up and I thought I wanted to learn it. I wanted to understand it and to see how powerful it was. I need to understand what the businesses were. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, actually I've talked about two of them. Yep. So the, when we did the episode about Abraham, when we were talking about a silly that yes. was going on inside of Congo, we charge for that water, remember? We charge for that health care. Those are businesses. Right. And so people pay for the water and they pay for health care. The other one is Kuja Kuja. So where, you know, refugees yes. rate that system. That is actually a business. Okay. It's been set up like a business. But neither of those came out of China. No. So what, what right. were your social entrepreneur <laughs> businesses in China? Well, at the time it was the mid-2000s and people were all talking about social entrepreneurship and I thought, well, I, I want to learn this. Yes. So I want to like do an MBA of entrepreneurship. But then I thought, I don't want to learn this from like social entrepreneurs. I thought I want to learn this from hardcore entrepreneurs and then apply it in the social context. And so then at the time I sat there and I thought, where are the world's hardcore entrepreneurs? Mm. And at that time it was three basic places. It was Silicon Valley in the US. Mm-hmm. It was actually in Israel. But the third one was Shanghai, China. I mean, China's had entrepreneurship for, I don't know, since its beginning. And so I reached out to my networks, my own networks and relationships to find someone who would give me a job to be an entrepreneur with them for a couple of years. And the person I found was an old family friend who was launching businesses. He's an entrepreneur himself. Mm -hmm. He was based in Hong Kong. He wanted to go into China, the mainland. 
and he wanted to um, do entrepreneurial things inside China and I went with him and uh, launched five businesses inside China based out of Shanghai. Can you tell me what they were? So one of those was electric motor scooters. So at the time, this was before Tesla and everything else, at the time China had uh, the most advanced technology on electrification of vehicles. Mm -hmm. And in particular, they had electric motorbikes. So in China, almost all the motorcycles were electric, not petrol powered. So we linked with an entrepreneur in Europe who wanted to take Chinese electric motor scooters and launch them inside Europe. And then we were the guys based in China that built the electric motor scooters. Right. So we would build the scooters, do the, all the manufacturing, and then the guy in Europe would take them and sell them inside of um, Europe. So one was an, this electric motor scooters. Another one was actually a surf company called Rhythm. <laughs> and they were a really like cool surf company based out of – a lot of surfing of, happening in China, I would have No, said. no, but there's a lot of making of hoodies and trunks and yep. T-shirts and things like that. So this group was a, was a sort of super cool Australian brand. They wanted to um, increase their production in China and then they wanted to launch uh, Rhythm into the US, Japan, Spain, Portugal – and so what we did is we helped them launch. So we created the manufacturing, but also I went to Huntington Beach in the U.S. and launched the surf company into the U.S. We launched it into Japan and Spain, Taiwan, actually. Uh, so those are two of the five businesses. And then you took those learnings. Into and applied it into the social setting. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Was that the first time you'd lived in China? Yeah. First time I lived there. So when was the first time you went? So the first time I went to China was in 1992. Uh, actually, there's a bit of a story with that. <laughs> <laughs> is it, hang on. Does this link back to a house in Sydney? Actually, it does link oh. back to the house in Sydney because that's, that's right at that time. Yeah, that's when we had that house in Sydney and where it sort of linked roughly around uh, – this was actually happened before the episode that I talked about going to Colombia. If yes. you remember, I met, met Bruchko. This was all that time where we had all these young people and we were sending them around the world. Yeah. And uh, one of the guys that got sent was a guy called Adam. Now, Adam also was the guy that started the first house with me. When I said there were two of us and we started this house, Adam was the other guy. Adam is mad. Actually, one of the, one of the great things about Adam, Adam's Adam mad, is, and that's yeah. coming from you. <laughs> one of the great things about Adam is, this will sound bad, but he's got something unique about his life in that the very worst things you can imagine have happened to Adam, but they always happen to him in a funny way. Oh. Yes. So I think it's, it's allowed him to keep his sanity. But he was in that house and he was one of the people that we sent out and he went to Mongolia and he was living in a place called Dahan on the border of Mongolia and <laughs> Siberia. I mean, it's lunacy. And he was one of the first Westerners to learn Mongolian. But the thing is what happened in Mongolia was it was a Soviet country and then in the early 90s, Soviets pulled out and just left Mongolia. Yes. And so Mongolia had a lot of troubles economically in the early 90s and that's when he moved over. Now, Adam looks a little bit Slavic. And so he was constantly getting beaten up because they thought he was Russian and they were mad at Russians. And so everywhere he would go, he'd get beaten up and robbed. And at one point after he'd been there about a year, he was like, I'm done with the Mongolians. Yeah. I can't stand them. <laughs> and so he flew out to Hong Kong and he was like, call me up. I'm done with the Mongols. I'm coming back to Australia. And I said, look, just wait in Hong Kong. I'll come up and spend a week with you and let's see if we can, you know, pep up your morale. So he said, okay, I'll wait here one week. So I get on an airplane and I fly and I've got six days there. And when I land, Adam's waiting for me in the airport and a coffee shop. And over the 24 hours, he's all different. He's back to being Adam again. Yeah. And as I come in, he's reading this book. He's all excited. And he says, um, how long have you got here? And I'm, I'm like, well, i got six days. And he said, we're going into China. Now, in the early 90s, it's not like China now, right, where yeah. there's like airplanes everywhere, everybody goes into China. In the early 90s, China was quite a restricted place. Right. It, we didn't have all these airplanes, um, quite, not hard to get in. You could get in on a tourist visa for a little bit, but you couldn't just freely travel around and do your thing. So he said, we're going to go into China. Mm -hmm. I said, what are we going to do in China? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, I've been reading this book. There are these communities in China called indigenous minorities. And he said they're really interesting, but they're really restricted. Chinese government does not want you to visit them. But I've read about this group called the Yao people, and I want us to go and discover and find the Yao people. <laughs> right. And I was sitting there at the coffee it's shop. It's a big country. This is I just walked off the airport. He's sitting in the coffee shop in the airport. Right. And then I go, where are the Yao people? <laughs> and he goes, they're in southern China. And then I thought, okay. Now, I thought he meant 
like I know exactly where they well, are. Well, they are, yeah. Yeah, but There's it's roughly southern or China. or a city or yeah. like a state. It turns out, no, no, no. He'd only narrowed it down to southern China, which I think at the time had a population of 350 million people and it's a vast expanse. But he said, we're going to go into southern China and we're going to find the Yao people. Again, I thought he had a lot more like backup uh, <laughs> going on here. So we both, he says, I say, okay, well, how do we go there? He says, well, we're going to have to take one day. It's going to take you a day to get your visa. So we spent this first day, 24 hours, getting my visa. So that gave me five days. This will be important for five days. <laughs> okay. So I had to get my aeroplane in five days' time. And so he says, right, we're going. Now he said, the problem is there are no aeroplanes in China. It's all done by trains. And there's a lot of people living in China, so the trains are always booked up. So he said, um, we're going to have to, like, wing it a little bit. Right. So I said, okay. So we took the train in Hong Kong up to this the, the border area, a place called Shenzhen, and he said, we stop there on the border, Hong Kong, China, and we cross over the border, and then we're approaching the first train station. And he says, um, we have to go to a place called Guangzhou. That's the main hub of southern China. And mm -hmm. he's like, every train that's going from here is going to Guangzhou. He said, but the trouble is we don't have any tickets and we can't get any tickets. It's so, not like India, you can't just jump on the outside of the train. No, China doesn't let that, that. They don't let that. Although I don't know that I would have wanted to do that exactly or sit on the roof of the train. But uh, he says, so I said, well, how are we going to get the seat? And he said, I want you to follow me oh, no. and do exactly what I do. Don't stop and don't look back at any time, but just do what I do. So I'm trucking with him, we're walking, and then there's a big, we go to the train station, there's a big cavernous hole, there's some turnstiles, there's a few guys sort of lazily sitting around, you know, guards or, yep. you know, whatever. And suddenly he just runs. And he runs wow. and he leaps over the turnstile in this jump. And as he does it, he's shouting out, hello, hello. And he's leaping over this turnstile. So I'm running after him and I'm leaping over. And the guys are spluttering up, these guards with the cigarettes, <laughs> spluttering up, hello, hello. And he's leaping over. And then i following him behind him, hello. Oh, hello. Oh, and you're I'd shouting leave. hello, hello as yeah, well? No, yeah, no, I'm just doing exactly what he said to do. <laughs> so I'm going, hello, hello, and they're going, hello, hello, hello. And then we start running through this. It's a very large train station. We're running around, we're zigzagging, trying to lose these guys. So we managed to lose them quite quick. I don't think they were very enthusiastic. Turns out that was the exit. <laughs> oh, right? So what he did is he took us to the exit. We leap over there like, ah, well, what's going to happen? And, um, <laughs> they're on their way out. <laughs> so so uh, then he goes up. And he says, we're going to find the first train going to Guangzhou. So we go up and we look at these different terminals and then we find one that's about to leave. And there's a reason for his madness. He said, right, remember, do what I do. Don't look back. When Whatever you do, don't stop until you find a seat and then sit in that seat and keep saying hello until they let you buy a ticket. So I thought, okay. <laughs> so again, this is my first time in China. Yeah. <laughs> so I go, there's a doorway there and there's a lady there in a blue conductor uniform and she, we walk up, she goes, tickets, 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 and she has the whole punch. And Adam goes, okay, let's go. And he pushes past her, hello, hello, and he starts running through the first carriage. And then I'm behind him, hello, hello. And then the lady that was at the door in the blue uniform is the three of us were running through this carriage. She's going, ticket, ticket, ticket. He's going, hello, hello, hello. So I'm sort of, hello, hello. <laughs> and we run through the first carriage, no seats. Then we go into the second carriage and we bust through and the second blue conductor gets picked up on us. And so there's the two of us running, shouting hello, and there are two conductors running behind us. Hello, hello. We ended up going through five carriages. <laughs> so by the end of the time we're in the fifth carriage, there are five Chinese conductors <laughs> behind us, all shouting, ticket, 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 and the two of us, hello, hello, hello. And coincidentally, we found two empty seats by them, you know, together. Yeah. So the two of us sit in these seats and we both held on to the seat. And Adam's just looking at this person, hello, no, no, five of them, yep. <laughs> hello, hello. And they're going, ticket, ticket. He's going, no, no, hello, hello. So finally they just give up. Right. Because they knew we're not going to go anywhere. And they got five of them and it's all chaos. And so we paid for the tickets and we get on the thing. <laughs> so we then travel to Guangzhou. And then he says, right, when we get to Guangzhou, it's like a few hours, a couple of hours. Then he says, um, this is going to be a long one. Is this okay? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated. So we get off the next one. Now, Guangzhou is a massive city, and southern China, it turns out, is very large. Mm -hmm. And he says, right, the three main cities of, as we're going, the three main cities of southern China are Guilin, Nanning, and Kunming. 
And he said, I think the Yao people are around those three cities. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I had no clue. So he's, he's based this just on the fact that he read a he book. He read the book. In an airport. Yeah. yeah. And then he said, um, so we're going to run through the terminal until we find the first train going to one of those three. And uh, There's lots he, of running. Yeah, because we thought we were going to be chased. Right. Well, you're, you're <laughs> more <laughs> chance of being chased if you're running, if you're running a around. Station. Well, he wants to get the first one that's going because we only had five days. Okay. So we hop on and we find the first one going to Guilin, which, by the way, turns out to be very lucky. Because the Guilin train was like 12 hours, 10, 12 hours. If we had have got on the Nanning or the Kunming one, they like two or three days. Oh, really? Yeah, I hadn't thought about this. Because these are old days, the slow trains. Yeah. But this is a massive distance, by the way. Purely coincidentally, we didn't get ourselves into a disastrous situation, but we got the Guilin one. So we did the same, he said, same routine. Oh, we don't have tickets. Uh, we're going to do it again, run on. I'm like, goodness. And, but luckily that time it was only the first carriage we found two because a sleeper train, we found two beds. We both lay in the beds holding onto the hand and then the lady, the conductor, ticket, ticket. But anyway, she let us by. So we got on that first Guilin. And then as the train pulls out, he says, um, well, that's the easy part finished. So, <laughs> so we go down to Guilin and we hop off the train in Guilin and he's like, now we need to find the Yao people. And then I said, do you have any, any ideas on this? <laughs> no, no, but how hard can it be? So we walk out <laughs> of the train carriage and there's a guy there, young guy, in this green suit. He has this red Dunhill tie. He's really slick. He comes up. Hey, great to see you. This real American accent. <laughs> great to see you. How can I help you? And we were like, um, you speak English? Yes, of course, I speak English. And then we said, um, okay, <laughs> we want to find the Yao people. And he's like, oh, really? Yes, the Yao people. And uh, he said, do you have the special permissions? And we were like, no. <laughs> he goes, well, you, you need special permissions to visit the indigenous minorities. Do you, you don't have any of those? No. And then he goes, oh, that's a real problem. You have to avoid, and Adam's been saying this, we must at all costs avoid Chinese communist officials because this is illegal. Mm. So Adam's like, yes, we must avoid the Chinese communist officials. So you have to tell us a way to get there where we never have to run into the Chinese communist officials oh, no. because they will, you know, do something. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, well, how do you do that? And he goes, well, you need to take a bus to a place called Lomshen. From Lomshen, you need to take another small bus to a place called Ailing. And it's only a short trip, 15, 20 minutes from Lomshen to Ailing, short trip. And then thirdly, when you're in a ling, you need to ask, point me the direction, where are the Yao people? And we said, will anyone speak English on this? He said, no one will speak any English. So I, I, we said, okay. So we pulled out a notepad and we said, write three sentences for us in Chinese. <laughs> Sentence number one, two bus tickets to Lom Shen, please. <laughs> Sentence number two, two bus tickets to a ling, please. Sentence number three, point the direction to the Yao people in Chinese. So he writes these things out, three things in Chinese. You didn't think to ask for like a bed or, you know. No, we we didn't. 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 Where can we stay? That was the only three sentences we got. And you may have figured out by now, I'm not big on advanced thinking. No. So, and Adam is even much worse than me. So I learned all that I know from Adam. So the three had this notepad. And we go, he takes us to the bus. It turns out he was the loveliest person in the whole universe because he just took us to the bus station, helped us out, shook our hands. So we, we hand over the, you know, the notepad and we point to the sentence, two bus tickets to Lom Shen. So we get the two bus tickets. And we get on the bus. And it's like, again, like the movies. Mm-hmm. We, we're going up the thing, chickens. We're going <laughs> right up these mountains. It takes hours and hours, but it's the most gorgeous, mountainous, southern China, fantastic trip. And but right at the end of right at the end of the day we arrive right on dusk, mm-hmm. and we are on the top of this mountain plateau. So we hop off, and we're in this sort of dusty bus station, and there are families all around us, like camped out in this bus station. Families everywhere. Some of them like cooking all this stuff, and we're looking out the windows of this bus station, and it's like this plateau of mountains, and we realize we're a long way from anywhere. And I turn to Adam and say, thank goodness you have that notepad. (laughs) And he says, what do you mean? 
I've got the notepad. Oh, no. You've got the notepad. <laughs> and I said, I don't have the notepad. You handed the notepad to the... And then we both realised we'd left the notepad with the ticket lady. And then we thought, well, what was the name of the other place? And then we knew it ended with Ling, but we couldn't remember the first bit. Mm -hmm. So we both stood in the middle of his bus terminal and we started shouting out variants on the name Ling. <laughs> now, Chinese is a tonal language, so this is a very, like, it's got, in Mandarin, there's like six tones for every word. So the Ling, we weren't even getting the tone right, but we had like six versions of just the Ling. <laughs> but we stood there in the middle of the room and we start going, Bing Ling. <laughs> and then we pause and look around at everybody. And everybody's there. And we're going, Ding Ling. Pause. Xing Ling. King Ling, <laughs> Ming Ling, we're shouting this all out. And so by now everybody's gathering around us. All these people are gathered around us as we're doing these random links. <laughs> Ming Ling, Ding Ling, Xing Ling. Looking, and every time we would say we would look to see if anyone acknowledged anything. And then finally one of us said, A Ling. And around the whole the group, oh, it's A Ling, A Ling, A Ling. And there was a murmur. So we thought that must be it. Yeah. It's A Ling. So then we would like did that gesture, you know, with your hands up like the W, where's Ailing? And they all point out the door, the certain direction. So off we go. We walk down the street and we get to the next corner and there's a person standing and we go, Ailing. And they point. And then we go to the next one. Ailing. Now, we thought they were pointing to a bus station. Because remember, we had to go on a bus that was for this 20-minute drive to Ailing. We thought they would know what we meant by that and that they would assume that we needed the bus. And so we thought they're pointing us because the bus that we were at was a terminal bus station. We yeah. had to go to, we thought, a local bus station. And so we're walking through the town, every stop, A-Ling, A-Ling, everyone keeps pointing. And then we get to the edge of the town. Right when sun, the sun is setting, we're on the edge of Lom Shen. And then we realize they're just pointing vaguely in the direction of the road <laughs> to A-Ling. And right on the edge of the town, we were thinking, well... This is a problem because it's getting dark and we're in this mountainous town and we don't even know that Ailing's the right name for the place. And then we're standing there and then Adam thinks, okay, I'll, I'll sort this out. And we see this white Toyota Land Cruiser driving toward us coming into town. And Adam says, remember, do what I do. Oh. Just say hello. <laughs> don't hesitate. So this white Land Cruiser is driving toward us and just when it gets near us, Adam jumps in front of the Land Cruiser and waves it down. And the guy pulls up and then Adam runs to the back door of the Land Cruiser, opens it, throws his duffel bag in and leaps into the back seat of the Land Cruiser and then I throw my duffel bag in and I leap into the back seat of the Land Cruiser and the two of us are sitting on the back seat of his Land Cruiser and this poor guy <laughs> in the front has got his hand over the thing and he's looking back at us like, <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> and the two of us are grinning and we're going, A-Ling, A-Ling. <laughs> and he's looking at us, A-Ling, okay? Because remember, we thought it was only 15, 20 minutes yeah. away and we were really stuck. And he's looking and we're sitting there, we're grinning like fools, A-Ling, and he's just looking at us. And then after a couple of minutes, he puts the car in gear and drives into town. And then we pull up in front of this restaurant and he hops out with two of his mates and they're sitting at this table and we're sitting in the back seat with the window. We're not going to get out because then we were afraid he's going to take off. So we're gazing at them through the window. They're all eating slowly and then they're talking to each other. Then they would all pause and then look at us like <laughs> lunatics and then go back. And then and we're going, A-Ling, A-Ling, doing thumbs up. A-Ling, A-Ling. And, and then finally two of them get up, hop in the four-wheel drive and we start going. By now it's like, 8 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And uh, we're driving along and 15 minutes goes by, no Ailing. <laughs> we're going further and further, 20 minutes, an hour goes by, two hours goes oh, by. No. And then we're at like two and a half, three hours and then we both turn to each other and we're like, what does Ailing mean? Oh. <laughs> like we didn't even get, it's not even the name of the right place because oh. we were only meant to be there in 15 minutes. <laughs> What's a Ling? And every time we would come to a village or a little town, because it's getting deep, deep, deep into the mountains, every time we would come to a village or a little town, Adam and I would go, a Ling, with like a questioning a Ling. <laughs> and the two guys in the front would look at one another and the driver would go, a Ling. And the other guy would laugh as if this is crazy that you think this is a Ling. <laughs> every time we would come to a town, a Ling, a Ling, the gales of laughter. So we drive for like four hours. We come down into this dark, 
dark valley and it is pitch black. And we see in the headlights this little bridge and the guy pulls over and stops and he turns off the Toyota and we're sitting in absolute pitch darkness and he looks at us and says, ailing. <laughs> <laughs> so the two of us get out. We get out of this car and he drives off. Uh, and then we're standing there. In, in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night in absolute pitch darkness and Adam just says, well, at least we're in no danger of running into Chinese communist officials. <laughs> 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 and so we, we stand there until our eyes get used to the light and we notice this gate, chain link fence in this little gate. And so we walk through this gate and we walk along this little path and then there's like a little wooden sentry box, like a little shed, and it has a crack of light around the door. So we go to the door and we knock on the door and there's a, a guy opens it, a real old sort of guy in a uniform opens it. And we look at him and go, A Ling. And he points to a side door and he nods, A Ling. So we walk through. We go along this path through this mountains around this edge of this hill and we opens up into this big expanse lit at night with all of these steaming baths. Oh, wow. It's like a hot spring yeah. bath resort. And in it is all these sort of pasty, older, middle-aged... <laughs> guys and we're walking through and they're all looking at us because we're just you know like we're just walking through and they're all looking at us out of these baths and then we go to the reception and the lady there did speak a bit of English and we said we want to have um you know two rooms and she's like uh well normally but I you know we go we have nowhere to go and then she's like well this is a special place <laughs> and then we go it's a special place. She goes, yeah, only special types of people can come here. We go, what type of people? And she says, Chinese communist officials. <laughs> <laughs> so we have been on the journey to escape them and we've gone to a <laughs> retreat where only Chinese communist officials are allowed. And so we look out the window and there are all these Chinese communist officials gazing at us through the window in these uh, ponds. But anyway, we were committed at that stage. So we were like, well, can, you've got to give us a room. We can't go anywhere. And they gave us a room. And then the next morning we – and they, these two guys didn't care. Hmm. And the next morning we got up. Don't worry, it's coming to the end. <laughs> we, we got up in the morning and then we were like to the waiters and the reception, Yao people. And they pointed and there was like a path. Yeah. Then it became like this sort of crazy thing. It took us, because this was, a, right now we're at start of the third day. So we start walking and we walk for like five hours and it is the most gorgeous, majestic mountains with these amazing villages, but they're all Han Chinese, all the people we go through. And we even did the whole, you know, that whole crossing with the suspended bridge. Yeah. We did that one. <laughs> we did the whole thing and then finally right at lunchtime, we turn the corner and the Yao people have a very distinctive, because they're indigenous, they have a very distinctive outfit. It's black and it has these sort of colourful, um, what do you call it, lining and trim mm -hmm. on their outfits. So we knew what we were looking for and we come around this corner. And you remember when that old Microsoft used to have the windows, used to have that screensaver of the most gorgeous, terraced, yeah. vibrant green? Yeah. It's just like that. We turn this corner and there's some of the, one of the most gorgeous valleys you can ever dream of opens up. And in the first rice paddy, there are three women there and they're the Yao people. So we had found the Yao people. But I look at my watch. It had taken me exactly two and a half days to get there. So we only had time for lunch. <laughs> so we managed to get and have lunch in this place. And by the way, Adam, there's a lizard there dried out. He makes the guy cook the lizard the whole thing. <laughs> and we have this lunch and, uh, we're, and here's the weirdest part of the story. On the way out. We've spent two and a half days, chaos, craziness. We are not clean. We think we've been on this amazing adventure. Mm -hmm. And then right at the end, the same turn where we first arrived, we look back to like get the vista. Mm -hmm. And two young Asian, probably Chinese people, all dressed in white, were running down the hill to the stream hand in hand, like a scene from Sound of Music. Oh, yes. Running down, running down, smiling, all dressed in white. And then we look at each other. And we're sweaty, dirty. <laughs> and to this day, it's a mystery to me how that even happened. It's like there must <laughs> it probably only from? was 15 minutes. I think those guys just drove us around for four <laughs> hours. I think they were just messing with us ser seriously. <laughs> 
But anyway, that's my uh, my first trip, and I got back <laughs> right at the end of um, five days. I made I'm, it back. <laughs> I'm surprised you ever went back after yeah, that. Yeah, no, I like China. That's great. And this is the, this is the country that's going to take over the world, right? right. This is... Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a theory on that too. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might. Hey, you've got a podcast. You might as well. You might as well tell someone. You, I do think you always got to be careful when people start talking about China because it means you've got a dose of the statesperson uh, syndrome. And so I don't want to. I'm not going to punch. Yes, you mentioned this yeah, before. I don't yeah. do that. I will say this though. I've noticed there are three kinds of people that talk about China. Mm-hmm. There are people that have never been to China, yes. and I've noticed those are the ones normally that talk about gloom and doom. You know, but China's going to go broke, China's going to collapse within the next month or so. Typically those people never been to China. Mm-hmm. Then you have another group who are very buoyant, very bullish about China, and when you talk to those people, they've normally stayed, they've gone there for a week. Mm-hmm. And they stay at an American or a European hotel chain, and the staff are all Filipino, and they have this amazing. Because Shanghai, Beijing or Shanghai, yeah, they're in the Shanghai. On the, if you're on the bun there, and you're in the, one of these ritzy, China looks like some magical city. And they come back. China's going to take over the world. Then there's the people that have lived there, and the people that have lived there have a much more nuanced view. Yep. This, and this would be you. This is me. <laughs> so I lived there for two years, and you know I had to get a plumber. I had to go to the grocery store. Yeah. I had to like live in that environment. And when you live in that environment, you realize it's got its problems. It's still a remarkable country, mm. but it's got its problems and it's not all this clear. So I can give you my perspective and it's yes, just please. my perspective on how this works, about this notion that China is going to take over the world. The way I think about it is more like this. You know, up until the Second World War, this was that was sort of the pre that it was the era of the empires, right? Yes. And largely European dominated, but it was the era of the empire. Yeah. And that all sort of collapsed after the Second World War. After the Second World War, up until now, you've had this period that's largely a period of globalization, but it's largely led and driven by the US with its Western allies. So you have mm-hmm. this sort of period since the Second World War where it's a Western-led, U.S.-led world order. Now, there was a point of time in that where there was an alternative, which was the Soviet um, yeah. sort of era. For, this was first and second world idea. Now, the U.S. system was a system of rules and values. So after the Second World War, they created a system that was based on liberal values, democracy, mm-hmm. and free trade. It's kind of like the rules and the values that underpinned the expansion of Western and U.S. interests around the world. It led to a period of actually great stability, Mm -hmm. of huge economic growth, and it pulled a lot of people out of poverty. And that's that sort of U.S. system. However, that system is now being contested. Now, the Soviet system collapsed in it, and so for the last 20 or 30 years, it's really been what I think we call it a monopolar world, yeah. meaning just the US, a dominated world. But I think over that time when the US and allies like Australia have had power, we have spoken about certain values, but not always lived up to those values. Yeah, we've spoken about democracy, but in some places undermined democracy. Yes, of course. Yeah. Sometimes we talk about free and liberal trade, and yet sometimes we tip the deck in our favor, right? So, so there's been question marks. But what's happened more recently, and, and this is quite, it's been picking up pace, but it really took off this year. And that is that China is now, even though China and the US were in lockstep with one another and both needed each other over the last 40 or 50 years, we're now at a point where China is trying to create something new. And it was launched this year, and it's got a, the name for it is this um, Global Civilization Initiative. But the idea of that is to say, stop interfering. We need systems around the globe that are not based on rules and values, but are based on something else. And key to that is non-interference. So essentially, you guys may have your values, yeah. you may have your rules, but stop imposing them on us. Whereas the US was about liberal values, democracy, and free trade, This new system is around things like common interest, beneficial deals, and sort of temporary alliances. And it's much more transactional. Yeah. So we don't really care what you do, but will you do a deal with us and can we work together? Great. That makes sense. And so that's the China system. 
And the China system, you know, the things you'll hear emerging from that are things like the BRICS, right? Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Yeah. That's a grouping of five countries that are saying, and that's about the US dollar, right? So the, the way that the US enforces this system is through two key things. Navy, military might, which keeps trade systems open. And secondly, the power of the US dollar and debt. So the creation of BRICS is to say, can we create an alternative currency so that we're not all dependent on the US dollar? You see the rise of the Chinese Navy. It's, you know, when you wanted to keep trade routes open, then the US Navy made that happen. Yeah. And so China's building its Navy to allow for its trade routes uh, to be open. And so you have a competing system. And so now I think they're calling it a multipolar world. And what what's interesting about it is you have a sort of a G7 system. Yeah. You have a China and maybe BRICS system, and you have 100 countries that are not aligned to either of these. And we've seen this play out over Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You've got 100 countries that have said, we're not on either of your side, and we're just going to react to you based on what's beneficial for us. Okay. And so you have major countries involved in that, but it's around 100. And so this is probably how things will play out over the next you know, generation or two. So the need for diplomacy is, is <laughs> increasing. <laughs> Yeah, because, because we have to negotiate our, our roles in the world. Yeah. We can't just deny this to China. China gets to choose this, yeah? and countries get to choose who they align with. And so diplomacy is all about how we navigate that kind of future. Wow. And so when you were living there, did you see the difference in the value system? I mean, you just talked about the US value system and the Chinese values. Like yes. What, yep. what, what the US think is important is very different from what the Chinese would think. Yeah, is uh, fundamentally different. The danger we're always in, and I'm going to borrow from a really bad old joke. Yep. The danger we're always in is to say that the big institutions, the big powers, the big countries have all the power. So they get to choose the economic systems that we all live in. They get to choose trade deals and how trade works. They get to choose alliances and nuclear deals. They get to choose what NATO does. They get to choose to create a $3 billion fund for the Amazon. They get to choose things like NAFTA. And what do we get to do? Well, at one level, and I think you may have noticed this in your own life, that stuff churns. What I've noticed over the last 30 years working in this, there's always some big bad thing that's about to happen. There's yeah. always some major deal that's about to be struck. And yet in the work that I'm in, for people living in refugee camps, poor communities in Central America, like if the big powerful people get to choose NAFTA, what do we get to do? Yeah. So in a place like Brazil, what we get to do is, for example, have a hospital boat that actually in a real and practical way finds indigenous communities and actually provides medical care to them. It means on a thing like climate, rather than arguing about big protocols, what we get to work on is let's just reforest the world. Let's just plant forests. Let's try to slow down climate change. Let's everyday people stand up and actually do something. That You know what I've discovered that we've, what we're launching in World Vision? And this is not, I know it will sound like I'm advertising World Vision, but I'm not, but it's so exciting to me. We have developed a health insurance product for poor families that costs $30 a year. Now, if we can roll this out, a health insurance scheme... Yeah. For poor families that works in almost every poor country in the world, that means if a poor person has to go to hospital or one of their family members has to go to hospital, they're not broke and wrecked for the rest of their lives and their kids can go to hospital and be cared for. This is a revolutionary thing. Is that, is that going to be a reality? Yeah, it's a reality right now and we're about to roll it out into more and more countries. I'm so excited about it. You know, the danger is that we watch the news and the news is all about these big things. And then we get told, uh, yes, that these big cultural forces that see the world differently. Well, they have an agenda as well, right? I mean, well, they the want to get clicks or engagement, but also yeah. that's newsworthy. But when I look at my life, I go, there are so many really big, meaningful, impactful things that we can do on team everyday people. And that's why I stay in nonprofits. It's why I didn't go down that route of social entrepreneurship. I only trust everyday people to do things to help other everyday people. Like we're our peeps. And if we don't look after ourselves, the others won't.
So there seems to be this. There's, here's the here's the big bad media saying China's going to take over the world. Russia's got the nuclear weapons. America's controlling the currency and the markets around the world. But underneath that is the reality of what's happening day to day. And there's people doing their things who that doesn't really impact. Doesn't really impact. Over decades it will impact. But actually, everyday people trying to eke out a life. Yeah. And how do we throw ourselves into that? And then some people may look at that and go, you're just talking about small things. I'm not talking about small things. I'm talking about reforesting 1 billion hectares of forest. I'm talking about giving every poor person on earth health insurance. There are a lot of big things that we can do. Yeah. So the upshot from this for me is that if you're going to China, take a phrase book. And... <laughs> <laughs> We'll get a tattooed on your forehead. Get a tattoo. And, uh, and if you need to get on a train in China, <laughs> jump the barriers I wouldn't try that. hello, I, hello. I wouldn't try that now. <laughs> I wouldn't try that now. But if you get a chance to travel with Adam, you really should. No. And you know what, you, you know what <laughs> no. Adam and you know what Adam does today? What, he's a tour guide? No, he's a skipper of the Sydney Harbour Ferries. Is he really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look every day in the newspaper looking for Sydney Harbour Ferry crashed into, you know, whatever, shipwrecked. Yeah. And I'm expecting to see Adam's You're name. Expecting there. That to but be it's him. been a while now and it's not happened. <laughs> Have you ridden on his ferries? No. No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Adam sounds like a character. Uh, hey, thanks, Daniel. That was a that was a great ride today. We'll talk to you next episode.